Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, Enda. Okay. So um, my, the title for uh, this afternoon's session, I think, we'll maybe pick up on some themes uh, that were discussed earlier today in various different ways, and then also maybe focus, I suppose, on the issue of publishing and how we think about publishing in this new digital era that we're in. Although we've probably been saying that for the last 25 years. Um, so I mean, maybe take the opportunity to think about what exactly we mean by that. Um, so, I mean, you'll see from the abstract I wrote that, um, you know, there's so many different dimensions to this, actually, when, when, when um, Eamon contacted me to, to do a talk on this theme, I was, my God, that's a, a vast theme, digital publishing um, or academic publishing in a digital era. So I kind of tried to, to focus it on, on three or four different ideas. And you'll see them there in orange. You don't have to read all of what's on the slide. But the, the writing process itself, no matter whether we're writing with or without digital tools, we're still writing. And digital tools will change it. So it's interesting to think about the writing process in a digital context. Um, you know, idea generation, sharing and access. Um, they're not new. They've been around for, for, for hundreds of years. But what, what does it look like today in terms of consumption of the Academy's goods uh, and, and how has that shaped the dissemination of academics' writing within and outside the academy? Um, I think they're, they are complex tasks. I think being an academic 20 years ago is a little different to being an academic nowadays in terms of academic writing, and it's certainly different than it was 100 years ago. There's a real political economy around publishing, and even preparing for the, today's session, I quite, got quite captivated by looking at the uh, quite tense debates between uh, universities and publishing houses that have been very lively in the last three or four years for a whole variety of factors. Um, and then, and in a way, I'm coming back to where I started with writing, but this time thinking of it in terms of there's a life cycle to papers, there's a life cycle to people. Even writing as a, a new academic is maybe a little different than writing as a seasoned academic and, 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 and in between. So there's many different dimensions to this. So in summary then, it's kind of thinking about writing, learning, and the tools that go, that go with that, including digital ones, the idea generation. And an idea generation to me is really a central part of thinking about academic work. You know, what are the good ideas? And one or two examples in terms of ways of thinking about that. Um, and then people and papers over time, how they've changed, how we think about that has changed, especially in this contemporary era. And then a, sh a short conclusion. Um, so, I mean, in a way, thinking about this presentation, I kind of was drawn back to core issues about, you know, the extent to, 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 to how, in terms of how we value and, and the purpose um, and function of academic research. You know, what actually is the value and purpose of academic research? I mean, that's the fundamental question prior to any notion of publishing. And then how do new forms of publishing um, in the digital era account, if at all, in academia, in, public, in the public sphere, in promoting citizenship, in making a better world. I mean, these are the, the fundamental questions that academics answer in various different ways, or the public expects them to answer and address. And then what counts in academia? I was on a promotions panel last week in UL, and it was interesting to me in the context of preparing for today's session, there was no talk about altmetrics, there was no talk about Twitter, there was no talk about blog spheres, and yet they're probably the, the bread and butter of uh, the digital era. So is it the case that in academia maybe we're quite conventional and we have a rather stratified understanding of what counts as quality uh, academic outputs uh, from, from, from lectures, etc.? Um, so at one level we talk about digital revolutions but there's not necessarily the same revolution in terms of understanding of academic outputs I think within academia more generally. Now listening to Deirdre Butler's fabulous presentation this morning here's a set of metrics on the mind rising project and it just struck me you know we moved the, the students who are maybe 9, 10, 11 who are doing these projects they'll be some of them will be maybe working in academia in 30 or 40 years but will they be presenting metrics like this of their academic outputs that will have, look at all the various pieces that are there, um, you know, the, 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 the impressions, the, uh, the number of, of, of hits in various different ways, you know, there's five or six different numbers there. Nowadays we tend to rely, rely on a relatively large or small uh, set of numbers to 
think about what it means to do academic research, given we're in the, this age where everything is counted. Um, and that wouldn't have been the case to the same extent at all 20 years ago. So that kind of even if we think about academic writing now, very quickly following on from that is the notion of how do we count the impact of that, of that same writing. But it was, it was the, the slide that Deirdre shared earlier today that made me think about this. Um, this was published this morning. Um, and it's going back to the, the idea of a good idea. It's a colleague at the University of Limerick, somebody mentioned this article was coming out. Um, and it's an article, it's, it's a, a surgeon at the University of Limerick Graduate Entry Medical School. And he's making a very new argument in medicine. And if somebody here is a, a biologist and somebody said, well, how many organs in the body? Uh, there, maybe there's an answer to that, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But he is identifying in this article a new organ. Right? He's making a case for a new organ in the human body. It's a powerful idea. Now, people will buy that or they won't. But if they do agree that it's a new organ, then there's a whole new field of medical research that will open up following that. Funding will flow from it. People will do their PhDs on it. People will publish in that area. So there's something powerful about not just an idea, but a good idea. So there's the press release. Again, just thinking about publishing. So you have the Lancet article, you have the press release, uh, altimetric score, I picked this up. They must have put up the abstract a few days ago. So there's already an altimetric score for that, uh, that publication. Um, and it's interesting, one of the arguments that's made, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes, around open access journals, is that, look, you know, with the current uh, higher education, if you will, uh, corralled access to journals, that people who need to read journals, namely academics, can read the journals. We don't need open access. But the next slide you'll see, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, half of the people who've looked at this journal, this, this journal article already are the public. And to me, that's quite telling. And there's a study there recently looking at access to university research. And, you know, look, all of us probably have access to university published academic research, but it's not available to the wider citizenry. And this is one of the arguments, I think, uh, that's becoming even more relevant now as we think of like, Horizon 2020 and global challenges or global challenges in an international worldwide context. That the world is, they say, take climate change. That the challenges are so great that we can't wait for journal ideas, good ideas and journals to become available five and ten years down the road. We need as many people on the planet to be aware of and have access to the best ideas as quickly as possible. But the current system within academic publishing, digital era it may be, it's still quite corralled. It's still a very protected space. There are all sorts of reasons for that, but that's the way it is. Um, so, one of, um, some of the ideas that I've been thinking about in preparing for today's session were kind of the interface between ideas and writing, publishing, uh, the digital dynamics of that, and then what it means for readers. And the readers piece is important. I mean, do we really think of readers only as academics, or are we writing at some level for the wider citizenry? Um, so kind of just to I've kind of structure the rest of the talk uh, in terms of three ideas. One is writing, and then the ideas and the political economy, and then kind of coming back to issues of writing and, and, and people and papers. So this first section then, um, I'm not sure you probably can see it from a distance, but uh, it was basically the idea that writing um, is a process that has a history, and that I, 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 I've used that title in a number of different ways. Um, up till maybe the, about the 1970s, um, th there was very little re research on the, the actual nature of writing. It was only with the cognitive revolution. Let's see if we take the cognitive re revolution really kicked off in the late 50s, early 60s. It took about 10 or 15 years, 20 years of research in, in the cognitive tradition for a focus to get very, very clear on the nature of writing, which is a highly, highly complex cognitive task. A lot of the early work was on more simple tasks. And in that process emerged a sense of how writing demands very sophisticated set of strategic decisions by writers. In, 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 akin to a kind of problem-solving 
approach. We tend to think of problem solving in, in maths and science, but writing is a problem solving task in itself. So, you know, we, we, if we think about writing, we tend to think of it in quite static terms nowadays. You know, we have our, we probably, we, we type most of the time. We don't use pens as much as we used to. Um, going to primary school and secondary school in the late 70s and 80s, um, I remember having to, to use a pen and ink. I don't think that's probably part of the, 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 the development of writing nowadays in, in schools. So even though um, at one level we have lots of new shiny tools for writing, we don't have to go too far back to think about what, what tools were like in, in bygone days. Um, even if you look at the top left there, the, you know, the idea of a, of, of a hammer and a chisel, um, that was one of the early writing tools. Um, I'll read, no, I can't even read it out myself. <laughs> uh, the, the screen is in a small here because it shows the next slide as well. Um, I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an intimidating and impenetrable fog. Want to see my book before? <laughs> the dynamics of interbeing and monological occurrences in Dick and Jane, a study of psychic, transrelational gender moves. Academia, academia here I come. Nice, you can always rely on Calvin for a little insight. That writing, when we think about the writing process, um, the cognitive tradition drew our attention to the kind of uh, the cognitive, the thinking, the knowledge associated with writing, but it's also an emotional process as this uh, slide, I think, captures. And whether we're writing in, with digital tools or without digital tools, uh, there's no escaping that kind of that interplay between affect and cognition in, in the course of writing. Um, I mean, one of the questions in, in, in that context would be maybe thinking about what are, what, what, what's that interplay between affect and cognition when we're writing full-blown journal articles, we're tweeting, we're engaging in the blog sphere. There's sort of different dynamics at play here in each of these in terms of cognition and affect. So I'll just go back there to... Um, I mentioned um, the, 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 the cognitive approach to writing, and I think it's, it's, it's no less relevant today. Uh, with all our digital tools, we still end up coming back to some of the core processes in writing around um, drafting, planning, revising, editing, and invention. That, that all of those are still very much to the heart of, um, of, of writing. That's that kind of classic article. If you Google it, you'll see it's got about three and a half or 4,000 citations. It ended up kind of launching 25 years of, of research on self-regulated writing. Um, but the core of it comes down to what's on the right there. It's this idea of comprehension, oh, sorry, composition monitoring and composition fostering. So what do we do ourselves or with our students to help them be aware of the, the process, the monitoring piece, to be aware of their own processes? So self-awareness is kind of the first phase of self-regulated learning. So how do we become aware of our processes of writing? What do we do to, in a sense, pause? Because the temptation, of course, is just to barrel on and write without doing much planning. Um, but there are very teachable um, strategies in writing. So the, this kind of cognitive approach captures that very, very well. So our, for ourselves and for the students we work with then, it's how do we foster a monitoring approach or self-awareness and then and it's simultaneously a, a, a composition fostering approach. And there's a parallel process in reading, actually. Um, so there's lots of people have, have done um, work in this tradition in higher education, and I think the ideas are no less relevant in a digital era. So you know, thinking about writing as a thinking tool as opposed to just a mode of expression, and there's an important difference there that, you know, that we actually learn to think by writing as opposed to expressing our ideas in writing. And I think in, a lot of the time, even as preparing for this session, I didn't quite know what I was going to, to do until I started writing and using the tool, whether it's scribbling on, um, scribbling on paper first, and then I started using 
um, uh, the, the laptop and then an iPad, but it's that actual process of engaging in the writing that we, we, we understand our thinking as opposed to figuring it out in our head and then doing the writing. But even helping learners to understand the use of tools is vital in, in, in fostering their own, their, own, their own learning. I know it's easy, at my, my, <coughs> excuse me. Um, my own background is in primary teaching, so I've always had kind of a, uh, a long-term interest in individual development in terms of writing. Um, and I'm not sure if you can read, if actually, if you want to start on the right there, there's a, uh, a nice reflection there on um, the process of learning to write over time. Uh, somebody at five years of age, 14 and now. Um, the brown dog was friendly, that's writing at five. My writing when I was 14. The chestnut colored Labrador with streaks of gold and his soft thick fur was amenable to the concept of doling out affection to his human counterpart. And my writing now, well, I think it speaks for itself. All right, so when we speak of progress in the digital era, what do we mean? You know, is that progress? It's interesting, is that progress in writing? Or is it regression? And, you know, when we actually, if we, that would be interesting to, you know, what rubric would we use to, 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 to assess the, the change in writing over time there? Because a lot of the time I think we tend to assume there's progress. Um, okay. So, uh, so, what's the point I'm making, spending quite a bit of time speaking about writing, is that writing as a process is core to all of our work. Uh, now, we have new tools, digital tools, for that process. But despite that, or, or I suppose despite that, in that context, it's helpful, though, to think of the tools as a way for advancing our thinking, not merely expressing our thinking. And digital tools offer us a wider array than tools in the past. So again, the point I made about writing as a process, and this may seem really obvious, um, but sometimes stating the obvious is really important, that writing is a learned process. It's very teachable and very learnable. Uh, and, 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 and in that context, it's, it, it can be seen and helpfully seen as kind of a self-regulated learning process. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a very interesting kind of line of literature to read, actually, is the history of research on writing um, over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, it, it, it mirrors quite a bit of the research in reading, but it takes some interesting um, side paths from that as well. There's a lot of overlap, but there, there's some interesting deviations as well. Um, writing is an emotional process. Um, I remember when I was at Michigan State, the head of department gave me some very valuable advice. He said, anytime you're sending off a journal article for submission, two envelopes, he said. One for the journal you're sending it to, and the second one, when it comes back rejected, and you're in bits, you just, throw it into the second one, send it off, and then go and sort yourself out. But it's very good advice. It's always to kind of uh, not get buffered by the, the, the emotional uh, impact of, of a particular rejection, and just keep going. Um, I've used that story uh, for myself, and, and, and talking to others about their writing um, since, and it's, it's, it's usually um, it's helpful, both to myself and others. Um, Brian McCrath this morning um, quoted um, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, was here in DCU recently and uh, reminded us and reminded himself that she had said that every organization is a digital organization and if not, they should be, etc. But to paraphrase that, every scholar is a digital scholar and if not, what? You know, we could break out into groups and we could do the, the uh, sharing the Padlet again, we could talk about that, I think it would be worth talking about that. If we're all digital scholars, what does that mean these days? So, part two, um, ideas matter. And so when I was in talking about ideas, I'm, I'm going to focus on the digital context for those as well. So in terms of thinking about digital era publishing. The ideas matter, of course, in general in academia, but also specifically in thinking about this topic in terms of, you know, the generation of ideas, the sharing, and then there's the political economy of access to ideas, which I spoke about a few minutes ago. Uh, if any of you, which I'm sure many of you are, are, are 
kind of futurists when it comes to technology, always asking what's coming over the horizon with regard to technology. Nicholas Negroponte uh, has been, I suppose, plowing that furrow for, so third, he was, I, was in, I think he did one of the first TED Talks in 1984. So what's that? It's a long time ago. It's 30 years ago, right? Um, the best vision to use to see the future is peripheral vision. Now, the next slide, you'll have to, it'll take a bit to swallow, but anyway, I'll put it up. My prediction is that we're going to ingest information. We're going to swallow a pill and know English and swallow a pill and know Shakespeare. It will go through the bloodstream and it will know when it's in the brain and in the right places it deposits the information. Now, I, I don't know. This is, is this the future of academic writing? It'll all be in a pill? Now, if you think that's incredible, in 1984, he predicted we'd move from the computer mouse to using our fingers to control interfaces. He also predicted in 95 that we'd soon buy books and newspapers straight over the internet. So how many believe the uh, ingestion of information? Show of hands? One to a handful? Okay, one or two. It's in, uh, you know. Right. So, okay, back to more mainstream ideas. <laughs> um, peer review. In a way, the, the peer review process and the history of the peer review process is a really fascinating dimension of, of the work of academia because in a way it reminds us very, sometimes very clearly and sometimes very opaquely, how ac the academy meets the market. Um, because it's been a central part of the academy for 350 years. We all write for no charge, uh, believe it or not. Right, now they're going to make us pay for open access for all sorts of interesting reasons in itself. Um, so we publish in peer-reviewed outlets to share, and that's what we do, we share our ideas with the sense that it advances our field or it contributes to the, the common good, the public good. So for instance, and this is, only, this is really what's fascinating me in, in preparing for this talk, is today at university libraries have paid high subscriptions to academic publishing companies for journal access, but they're almost, I think, at about the stage where they're saying, stop. There's been a rethink of this relationship. And now, so like, one of the predictions is I think that by 2021, over 50% of academic publications, 51%, will be open access. So that means in the next five years, there's going to be a very big change, pushed on in large part by the digital era we live in and the digital tools available for sharing work, be it academic or otherwise, uh, in, in changing our access, the public's access to knowledge. And so there are all sorts of very good reasons why that should be so, and maybe why it shouldn't. Um, and lest we not want to take that seriously, if you look at the 80 billion invested by the European Union in Horizon 2020, there's a mandatory clause in that, whoops, there's a mandatory clause in the H2020 about open access publishing, which I'll come back to in, in a minute or two. Now, so and kind of moving towards the idea of open access publishing, I can't go there without first thinking and talking about um, what, this is a fascinating study, and nobody will beat this in terms of the, the number of data points in a study. This is a study just pu published in PLOS One uh, journal, an open access journal, and there were 45 million publications in the web of science were analyzed recently. Um, and basically, the, one of the findings, this shows how we live in a kind of stratified world of academic publishing. More than 70% of the social science publish, publications are in, are in the, are put out by five publishing houses, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, Taylor and Francis. There's a fifth one missing there. Anyway, there's the, they're there. the, 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 so there's a real control of that space, and that's changed over time as well. It's 50% outside of the social sciences, but social sciences in particular are very, uh, very much controlled by a small number of publishers. And that had that, in their analysis, they showed how that's impacting and changing citation patterns. Um, and there's that kind of screenshot of, 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 of that public. And actually, you can even look at the metrics there. That's been downloaded 90,000 90, times, or 90,000 views since it was published last year. 
So at one level, open access seems to kind of uh, throw and um, give unfettered access to the goods of, of academia. But that's not to kind of leave behind the idea or not, not to confuse open access with free because somebody is paying, right? Somebody is paying, but it, the open access just changes who pays or the, the timing of the payment. So the academics or their institutions end up paying for the by article as opposed to for the journals. So the payment is just moving around the money. Um, but the, uh, the, the appeal of open access, I think, is, is, is quite powerful nonetheless. Um, how many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you publish uh, kind of in terms of green access, where you publish in a local archive? It's a relatively small number. It's interesting. Five minutes, thanks. Oh, that works. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's when, uh, how many? How many of uh, gold have published an article with gold? So you pay the publisher one. Somebody, one. Okay. Right. So, but I, you know, I think um, in the next five or ten years that will change. If we were in ten years' time, there'd be a lot more hands going up. But I think this, there is something happening in academic publishing at the moment, and we're just right at the cusp of that. And the H uh, twenty twenty policy, I think, is a good pointer to that. So, why does all this matter? Um, ten years ago, uh, Wilinski, who's really one of the, kind of the earlier the people discussing this, um, spoke about um, a, you know, the commitment in academia to the value and quality of research carries with it a responsibility to extend the circulation of such work as far as possible, ideally to all those who are interested. In a sense, that our job is not done when we, we publish it wherever we do, but even to go a step further. And I think that's... I, uh, the academy is moving into that now, space now with, with policies around open access. So the quality other then is the equity. Um, uh, he, Wilinski gave a lovely example of a library in Kenya which had only access to six journals in the late 90s, six medical journals, and then the World Health Organization in 2001 negotiated access to the electronic um, archives of hundreds of medical journals for 101 developing countries. You know, and again, it, that, that kind of imperative around making the world a better place becomes more clear when we look at access to particular areas, maybe health, or maybe education, or others. So 2001 was a turning point. But this open access idea is not new. It's been around for about 40 or 50 years. Um, but it's, it's only, I think, it's really, I think it's getting to a tipping point at this stage and it will change all of our, 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 our publishing habits in the next five or ten years. Um, so the access principle, the, one of the, the screenshot on the left there is Wilinski's book and then there's another more recent one. This book has become widely discussed in the open access movement. Uh, it's by Subuk, Subur and it's published by MIT Press. And so there are a few different you know, sources of evidence to look at this turning point. So in, in, in uh, 2003, for example, nature placed open access movement right up there with all the biggest stories of the year. So 15 years ago, open access was out there as a big story, but we're still only getting to grips with it. You know, the academic publishing houses have been trying to grapple with this for quite a long time. So you know, how have we got to the point where the open access is, is the royal road for the future? Well. Horizon 2020 is one example where I think it's going to be much more uh, on our desk than it would have been in the past. There's a pilot study on open access now with the EU. Um, there's e e European Commission interest in green and gold access. The next slide you'll see a recent report just out in the last six months um, or about nine months on this very issue. Um, and why has it been driven in the European context? Well, one of the arguments across Europe is that there, there, there's an, an underlying need for you know, more flexible and seamless access to ideas across cultures and countries in Europe. Because even looking within the European Union, there's differential access to academic publishing, quite stark differences across Europe. So, um, 
that's that report if you're interested. Again, I can make the, 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 the slides available after. So what's the argument in, in, in the European context at least? I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you have the serials crisis, which I mentioned, the universities and publishers, the administrative burden, the publisher perish, collaboration or competition, there's the questioning of traditional publishers, the oligopoly, um, and there's also pressure from policymakers, and Horizon 2020 is a great example of that, so that the global challenges that Horizon 2020 is putting out there, the Euro European Union doesn't want to fund, put 80 billion in research funding, and then have all of that corralled behind paid, paid subscription journals in, 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 and with only academics, the only ones who can have access to that publicly funded uh, research. So there are powerful arguments in favour of open access. Um, now, this is not without its problems. You could argue, though, that, you know, uh, I think Connor was alluding to this point this morning in his response in one of the panels, that the world is a very different place and you have big mammoths out there who are taking over large tracts of academic publishing. So Pearson publishing is now also Pearson higher education. So that's oligopoly 2.0. It's a whole new level where you have Pearson higher education offering learning solutions. Who doesn't want a learning solution? Um, Mark sent me on this paper, and it's a study of academics' knowledge of open access. And the basic finding from it is that the academics have limited enough knowledge of open access, its dynamics, its, its origin, its implications for their work. So I think partly because it's driven on by the digital era, but I think it's a real challenge for, for all of us. Um, uh, so, now, the last t bit in about two minutes. Okay, so I'll fly through this. So, where were we? Where did we start and where are we now? So, we talked about writing as a process, how the digital tools have only changed our experience of writing at an individual level, a collective level. But then there's this wider politics of writing and the political economy of writing, which has made our job, um, I think, more complex, more interesting, and the decisions we have to make as authors is different now than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. So imagine a seminar for doctoral students writing in 1916, we all have to do 1916 to 2016 this year, and 1996 and today, you know, what would we, what would we speak about? Um, so, we might talk, in 1916 it might have been writing, typing and rhetoric. In 96, it might have been about the writing process, word processing, we don't use that term now. Journal impact factor, maybe web publishing, open access, paradigms. Today, we'd have writing process again, paradigms, impact, not impact factor, maybe impact. Journal quartiles, impact factor is kind of passe now, it's journal quartiles. Citations, open access, much larger. Social media, right? more complex landscape, way more decisions. So, despite all that, and there's lots of um, what you might call, you know, old practices like hunting words or, you know, sitting with the book and pen. Um, I'm going to just go back. There's a famous, I think you've come across this, what's called Mishag is Pangorban. It's a famous poem written in the seventh century. Um, there's a, the, the original old Irish version, the new Irish version, the old Irish version, it's been translated into English by five or six different, and the meanings have shifted across all the translations, which in itself is interesting in terms of intertextuality and what it means to publish. And, but the point is that in that, okay, <laughs> the, the, one of the phrases that that, 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 that monk who, who wrote that was, he said his job was hunting words. And we're, we're not far from that, no matter who we're writing, whether we're tweeting or we're doing blog, or it's an article, we're still hunting words, and we still have to sit with the book and pen, or phablet, or iPhone, whatever it happens to be. Still core challenges haven't changed. Now, that said, um, the meaning of the text and the stability of the text has, has changed. I think that's one of the arguments that people would say in terms of contemporary writing is that the stability of the, the, the text is different than it would have been 100 years ago. There's the, the greater movement because of um, all the different ways of representing ideas and knowledge. So that Mishog is Pangorban, which changed meaning, which you could say the meaning is over the various different versions. That's not a whole lot different to the way that our ideas may shift in the current, current kind of digital era as we represent them in different formats and infographics and text. So what I might do is just to conclude, I liked, uh, I was only 
doing a conclusion slide when I heard uh, Grania's uh, comment from Castells about informed bewilderment. So where are we with digital, uh, the digital era and writing? In a way, it's maybe informed bewilderment. Uh, so Castells may not have been far off there. So what do we have? We have greater access now potentially to people and ideas. We have new ways to gather and represent data, new ways to share, new measures of impact. Look at the metrics tide, public report published last year, uh, documenting the powerful ways in which um, uh, the work of academics has been measured and is impacting uh, all sorts of practices inside and outside academia and funding agencies, etc. You know, I think there'll soon be a measure for not just the person who's read your paper, but the person who's thinking of reading your paper. Um, the old and new practices, writing in the... Uh, so, you know, just looking down through the latter part of that slide. So the final point is the dynamics of publishing are more complex, and they're more complex for all of us, for novice and experienced authors. So I kind of will leave it there since I got my final, the final whistle there about a minute ago. So thank you very much, and thanks to the organisers for the invite.